preaching text is from 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be reading from verses 1 to 5 um, from the CSB version. It reads as follows. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen, living as exiles, dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because his great mercy, because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray this morning, church. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day. Uh, what a privilege it is to be in your presence with your people, Lord. Um, we ask that you may bless the reading of your, of your scriptures, the reading of your word. We ask that you may be with Reino this morning as he um, describes and explains and reveals to us what you have to share for us from your word, Lord. So speak through him, Father. May you bless the preparation um, and the word that he's going to be delivering to us. May you open up our minds, Lord. May we receive from you. May you speak to us. May we be sensitive to the leading of your spirit. May we be sensitive to what you are saying to us as a church and to us as individual believers, Father. So bless our time. And bless the service. Bless the, the preaching of your word this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hope is powerful. Hope is what carries people in a war-torn country like the Ukraine. Hope is what keeps the people who were victims of the flood in the KZN or in KZN going. Hope is what carries the unemployed. Hope is what carries a broken marriage. Hope is what carries single parents to keep going. Hope is what carries the mentally ill. Hope is what carries the broken hearted. Hope is what carries people at the end of their rope. Hoping for something and then having that hope disappointed is a devastating experience. Hoping for something and then having that hope realized is an amazing experience. And I want to put it to you this morning that hoping for and in something that can never disappoint you is the privilege and the experience of the Christian. We hope for and in something that can never disappoint us. And that is our privilege. And that is what we ought to experience as Christians, sons and daughters of God. We have hope. Why? Because Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. And this means everything to us as followers of Jesus. We are currently in a series called The Resurrection and Your Life. And in the series, we are trying to explain and understand how profound the resurrection is to our everyday lives. Last week, we spoke about a new vision and having our hearts warmed, the way we look at uh, the events of history and the way we look at our world. Today, we'll be speaking about hope. Next week, we'll speak about where all of this is headed, and it'll have a nice tie to this week. We'll speak about the significance of our day-to-day -day lives as Christians in this world. And we'll also speak about, are we waiting on all things to be made new, or will, all, all, or will we have all new things? That's the scope of this series. The teaching text for today comes from 1 Peter, as you heard. It is a letter written by the Apostle Peter. And in this letter, Peter explains 
what it means to be the new covenant people of God. You guys will remember at the last supper Jesus had with his disciples, he broke bread and he poured wine and he said, this is the sign of the new covenant that I am now instating with you guys. In uh, 1 Peter 2 chapter 10 it says, for once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. So Peter addresses the scattered people of God, which means that it's relevant to us today as well. It's a powerful epistle. Martin Luther, the great reformer, believed that it contained everything that was necessary for a Christian to know about the Christian faith. In this epistle, Peter covers so many important topics about the Christian life. And in this epistle, he gives us a glorious portrait of Jesus, which means that a gospel-centered church like ours should take this letter really, really seriously. And here's what Peter says about Jesus. I want you to just hold on to this as a main idea for the whole book. Peter says, Jesus is the object of our faith, and he gives us the pattern for our lives. It's quite easy to understand. We believe in Jesus, and then we do what Jesus did. We lay down our lives, we serve, we love, we give grace. And we also share the good news of God's love. And Peter says that the resurrection of Jesus is the source of, for this new life. So object, pattern, and source. We believe in Jesus, and then we follow him and do as he did. And the only reason why we can manage this is because of the fact that he was resurrected from the dead. That's the source. There would be no new life if there was no resurrection. In this letter, Peter also has a strong emphasis on hope. And I want to say that it's safe to assume that everyone sitting in front of me this morning and everyone we meet daily is dealing with something in their lives. And I think it's safe to assume that no one we meet or no one sitting in front of me is over-encouraged. Think about it. Can anyone say this morning, dude, I am really good. You don't need to encourage me. You don't need to tell me to keep going. You don't need to tell me any good news. I am solid. None of us can say that this morning. We need that. That's what we do when we are together. And also, when we just sit and pause for a moment and give an opportunity for the Spirit to enlighten our lives, we'll know that we are dealing with stuff. And that's why Peter encourages his people. That's why we are encouraging each other from this letter this morning. Joseph Parker, he was a contemporary of the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he once said to a group of aspiring ministers, people who wanted to preach in the public domain, he said, Preach to the suffering, and you will never lack a congregation. There's a broken heart in every pew. It's a significant saying now, isn't it? And Peter shows us in this letter where our greatest encouragement comes from when we are facing trials, and that is the gospel itself. What Jesus did on Easter weekend, his life, his death, his resurrection. Now, Peter was a key leader in the early church, just trying to help us understand that this was a letter written by someone to someone. He was a key leader uh, in the early church. Peter's story is a fascinating story. If you've ever read the Gospels and then the book of Acts and then his epistles, you'll go, wow, this dude went from being the first one to recognize Jesus and to say, you are the Son of God, the Messiah, he was also the one to deny Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. He was also the one to who Jesus said, feed my sheep, and I'm restoring you back into a position of influence. And then he's also the one that preached a colossal conversion service in the book of Acts, and eventually uh, went on to lead the church. Peter traveled to Rome after the events in Acts 12. So if you look at Acts 12, you'll see that James was killed and Peter was jailed. And then Peter was freed from jail by an angel. And Herod was trying to kill him at that stage. So he eventually traveled to Rome. And he wrote this letter somewhere between the 50s, the late 50s and the early 60s, while he was actually in Rome. In the book of Peter, in chapter 5, you'll see that he refers to Babylon. And he uses the name Babylon to describe Rome. The tradition has it that Peter was martyred during the reign of Nero, so he was killed for his faith. And shortly after Peter was killed, Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. Because Peter relayed many stories of what they experienced with Jesus in the flesh to Mark. And once Peter was killed, Mark went, oh my word, he's going to go to the grave with these stories. I'm going to have to write them all down. And that's where our first Gospel comes from, the Gospel according to Mark. The reason why I'm telling you all of this is because I want you to know that Peter knew what it was to struggle. 
Peter knew what it was to sin. Peter knew what it was to be restored. And Peter knew what it was to suffer. So we should take this person's words really, really seriously. He writes in the beginning, uh, to those chosen and those in the dispersion. Now, uh, Emperor Claudius, or Caesar Claudius, in Acts chapter 18, verse 2, we read about this. He expelled a lot of Jews from Rome, and with those Jews, he also expelled a lot of Christians, because they often met in the same place for worship. So the best theory we have of who these people are that Peter is writing to is a bunch of expelled Christians sent away from Rome, and then going to all these places that uh, Murendeni read in our teaching text. Maybe, Rudolf, if we can have verses 1 and 2 on, I'll be glad. Thanks, mate. So he's writing to encourage these people who are dislocated, right? They're not in their normal homes, and they also feel really estranged in this world that they are living in. So think about it. I'm not in my natural home, and I'm also not in my heavenly home yet. I feel quite strange, and I feel quite displaced almost a double stranger. And what I want you to see in uh, the first verse is that Peter wants these people to know from the get-go that they are chosen. Just let that sink in. Twice we'll see the word chosen. I underline them for you. To those chosen and chosen again. And not chosen by only one person of this trinity we call our God but by all three. Do you guys see it? Chosen and chosen by God the Father, according to His foreknowledge, chosen by the sanctification of the Spirit, and chosen for obedience to the blood of Jesus. Guys, whatever you are facing today, whatever you are going through today, whatever you think about yourself today, know this, is that if you are a Christian, God chose you. And He didn't only choose you to be His child, He chose you to be sanctified by His Spirit. He chose you to be obedient to the blood of Jesus. And He chose you because He knew it far, far, far in advance. This is where Peter starts when he writes to these people. Chosen, all of you, for all of Him. And then Peter breaks out in this beautiful song of praise which is all the way from verse 3 to verse 12. The Father is to be celebrated and delighted in for who He is and what He has done. Why does Peter start with praise? Because oftentimes our trials can blur and blind our view of God's goodness. I know that's part of the human experience. I am going through a hard time, so therefore God must have. We are always in the temptation to believe that. And Peter doesn't want these people to believe that. So he starts by establishing their identity, reminding them of it, and then breaking out in praise of how awesome God is and of how awesome it is what God has done for them. One long sentence written in the Greek from verse 3 all the way through to verse 12. And I actually wanted to cover all 12 verses, and I just decided that it's impossible for me to do it because then you guys will have to sit for 90 minutes and listen to me because there's so much in there. We might come back to First Peter a little bit later, but it's one long praise song. Why? Because his subject is salvation, and he just cannot stop praising God for the salvation that he gave to his people. And as he praises God, he gives us three reasons to have hope as Christians. And it's all tied to the resurrection of Jesus. Okay? So here's the three points we'll be looking at. Christians have a living hope because, here we go, we have been given a new birth, we have been given an inheritance, and we are guarded and protected. Those three points. And we will look at all of them one by one. So firstly... We have been given a new birth. That's the first thing Peter mentions. We have a new life in Christ. It means being born again. It means new birth. Just look at the feet of this brand spanking new baby again. If you were at our baptism service on the 10th of April, you would have seen it, and I decided to use it again. That child is brand new, probably only a few minutes old, maybe even an hour. That is how new that photo is. That's where we start when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. 
we start over. All our other scars and blemishes and bad patterns and everything is something of the past. We have an opportunity to start in a brand new way and to grow into this new identity that we have. You guys will remember when I showed this image on the 10th of April, I said, this kid can't run, walk, talk, or do maths yet. This kid will have to learn it as life goes on. And someone will have to steward this kid and raise this child. It's the same in the Christian life. We have to start over. It's more than just cleaning up our lives a bit. It's more than just trying again. It's more than just turning over a new page or a new leaf. It's new life. And it's not optional. It is necessary. No faith in Jesus Christ can go without this experience of being born again or being regenerated or experiencing this new life. It doesn't make us perfect, but it does change us. And it does give us new opportunity. Now what I want you to see is that this, according to Peter, is all God's work of mercy. Did you guys see that? In the beginning, ach, in the middle of verse 3. Because of His great mercy, He has given. And then He keeps on with His praise point. So the new birth that we've been given by God's mercy is related to the resurrection of Jesus. If we can have, thank you, Rudolf, you read my mind there. Look at it. Into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. So no new birth possible without the resurrection, but new birth definitely possible with the uh, resurrection. The old has gone, the new has come. And not even death can take away this hope of ours, because we share in the resurrection victory of Jesus. That's really important for us to know, guys, is what is true for Jesus is true for us. That's the good news of the gospel. He conquered sin and death, and therefore we don't have to pay for our sin by our death. He conquered the power of death, and He was raised from the dead, so He will live forever, and therefore the same is true for us. We need to believe this. So we've been given a new birth. It's through this resurrection. We have this marvelous opportunity to start over, and therefore it should give us hope. So mercy brings this new birth, and this new birth brings a bright future. Let's look at the feet of the baby again. Who wouldn't look at this feet and go, oh, this kid has such a bright future in front of him or her? Because you're just starting over. There's so much excitement about all these new possibilities. And it's the same for us as Christians. We have a bright future ahead of us. And being future-oriented as Christians is really, really basic to our Christian living, guys. And it is especially important when we go through a season of suffering. Here's the truth. The best is yet to come. Do you hear me this morning? That's what the Bible testifies to. Or let me say it in reverse. You and I, today, in 2022, on the 1st of May, cannot get closer to hell than we are now. If we are Christians, think about that. You might feel like your life is really comfy. The eternity will be way better. You might think your life is really poor. You will not spend eternity like that. That is the truth. The best for us is yet to come. And hope is powerful for us to endure hard times. Parents in the house, can I see some hands raised? Parents in the house. Broccoli, rice, carrots, a child, fork in food, spinning and spinning and spinning it around and not chowing it. And then you say, listen, if you finish this food, you will get a sweetie. And then you see kids eating. Why? Because even though I don't like the taste of the broccoli that I'm eating at the moment, what is coming and what is waiting to me is good enough for me to endure this hardship. Kids in the house, you have to eat your broccoli, right? Just saying. Broccoli, carrots, all of those things are really important. But think about it. We have the ability to endure hard times if we know that something awesome is waiting for us. And what is waiting for us is way better than the dessert I just mentioned. We have a future, a future eternal hope. And that has to empower us to live today. We have hope because we've been given a new birth. We can start over. The future is bright. We know what lies ahead for us. It's all made possible because of the resurrection. And therefore, we have hope.
Second point. We have been given an inheritance. So I've got an image for you, but it's actually the antithesis of what the Bible describes. It means it's the opposite. Because if I would tell you this is your inheritance, you would laugh at me. It's a joke. It's useless. And that's exactly the point. The inheritance that's given to us is the exact opposite of this. So I'll just leave the image on there for a second. We have been given an inheritance. So Peter, as the text goes on, he highlights the believer's inheritance, and he says, this is your portion of the new creation that you will receive with all its blessings. Do you know that? You and I, children of God, have a new inheritance, and it's like the promised land in the Old Testament, it's just way greater. Remember the story of the Bible in the Old Testament? God said to his people, uh, uh, in slavery and after slavery, after they were freed and saved in the wilderness, something awesome lies ahead for you guys. So keep going, do what I ask you to do, because you will receive what I promised you will receive. So the promised land in the Old Testament did inspire faithfulness to the people of God, and the new promised land that awaits us should do exactly the same. Now, I don't have to describe the new promised land because Peter describes it in the text, if we can just have that up again, with three unbelievable adjectives. Look at it. He calls it imperishable. That means it can never be destroyed. The old promised land was destroyed and ravaged by war for a really long time. The promised land that awaits us as Christians will and can never be destroyed. Imperishable can only describe eternal realities. Eternal. God himself. God's word. Our resurrection bodies that we'll live in someday. That's just part of the list of eternal realities. The inheritance that we're getting is imperishable. It cannot be destroyed. And that is in contrast to earthly possessions that will experience decay, that will be destroyed, that cannot last forever. Paul said in Romans 8 verse 21 that the whole creation is in bondage to decay. It is destined to be destroyed or gone at some point until God makes all things new. That should be a sober reminder to us. Make all you want. Acquire all you want. It won't last forever. And you will not be able to take it with you, neither you or your offspring. That's really important for us to remember that. No single person can take a coffin and a easy-to-move van into the grave. It will not last forever. It's all temporary. Our inheritance is not. It's imperishable. The second adjective he uses is undefiled. Clean. So think about this, the land that God promised Israel had to be cleaned for them to go into the promised land. That's part of the story of the Old Testament. Unfortunately, later, this beautiful promised land was defiled again by idolatry and by war and by other world powers taking them over. Our new creation will be unpolluted, listen to this, unpolluted by sin and corruption. Where can we go now in this world where we will not find sin and corruption? The answer is nowhere. But our glorious inheritance that will wait for us one day will be completely undefiled. I tried as I prepped this sermon to imagine what this world is going to look like, and guys, I could not find words. But that's something that I love keeping myself busy with, is just imagining how glorious the peanut butter will taste in the new creation. Just imagine how fast I'll be able to run three times the comrade's distance in the new creation because there won't be time. Can you imagine that? I'm going to complete the comrades in one billion years. Okay, dude, enjoy. It's going to be phenomenal. (laughs) Okay, anyway. So I tried, but I couldn't find a way to explain this undefiled, clean inheritance of ours. And I think that's a good thing. I think we should imagine this. I think we should allow the Spirit to illuminate our thoughts. Look at the third one. It is unfading. It won't spoil and it won't diminish. It won't fade like all of our earthly possessions or wealth will fade. The new creation will never lose its glory. It will never get old. 
I am a rugby fan, and I am also a football fan. So please do forgive the fact that I'm now going to use a sporting metaphor. Think of the current Springbok captain, Siam Tanda Kulisi, lifting the World Cup. That is glory. That is goose flesh. And that is something that never gets old to me. It doesn't matter if they use two seconds in advertisement or if they show the whole ceremony. When I see it, I get the shakes, goose flesh all around. My body temperature rises because there's something that I'm seeing and feeling and experiencing when I look at that glory. Never gets old. Peter says, our inheritance will never get old. It will never spoil. I love a glass of milk, full cream, fresh, absolutely phenomenal. There's something about going third swig, fourth swig, fifth swig, and it feels like all the cream is just covering the esophagus. Have you ever done that with sour milk? It's a shocker, because you also only taste it after like the second gulp. I've done it before. Yep, yep. Ah, oh, this is bad, because it spoils. It's great when it's fresh, but it eventually gets old. Our inheritance will never get old. Why? Because it's kept in heaven for us. God has reserved it for you and I. Then when was the last time you went to a movie? It's been quite a while for me, to be honest. But there's a stress about going to a movie, and this is the stress. I've got a ticket that says row C, seat 6. I bought it. I chose it on the screen. I'm going to go and sit on that seat because of the location with regard to the screen. But then you walk into the cinema and you kind of approach row C and you go one, two, three, four, oh, snap. I think there's someone in my seat. If you find an empty seat, it's great. If you find a full seat, it's always awkward because, dude, it's my seat. Yeah, but it's also my seat. Ah, well, you know, dude, it was reserved for me. That's not what our inheritance is like. Our inheritance is reserved for us by God himself. And he's keeping your spot reserved. No need to feel the tension of, will I actually find it one day? It's a done deal. And it's kept safe for us. Third one, and we land with this. We are guarded. We are protected. Peter uses military language here. When he talks about guarding. So I put a, a, a photo for us. We might not necessarily identify with a knight's armor that well as people living in South Africa. But I do believe that if you just think about wearing this armor, all of us can imagine how safe you must feel. I mean, think about it. There's no part of you that is left uncovered. And you are covered by a material that can take arrows and other weapons of mass destruction. I'm joking, not mass destruction, but just other weapons. This is the language Peter uses when he says that we are protected and that we are guarded. On the one hand, the language he uses says that we are guarded in this way. And then on the other uh, hand, the language that he uses says that God guards us in this way. Think about that double protection. It's not like I only have my armor on. It's also I have God in his armor in front of me, protecting me and guarding me and keeping me safe. How confident can we be if the God, the creator of this universe, is the one who protects and guards us? Think about it, guys. No disease, no disorder, no death. Nothing can threaten God's powerful protection. And that's important for us to know. Even though you might be in a bad spot, you are never vulnerable. You are never exposed. You are never alone. You are always, if you are a child of God, guarded like this. You are protected. For what? You are kept safe for what? Look at the last verse. If we can just have the text back on, please, Rudolf. Look at the last part of verse 5. We are protected for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. The last time in this portion of Scripture is referred to as the final stage of redemptive history. And that is when Christ will return to bless and to judge. 
That's something that has not happened in history yet. And the focus here is on the blessing of Christ's return. Because we will then finally be saved, finally be adopted, and finally taken home. Think about it. So while we live in this world we live in, we are protected in this really, really profound way. And one day will come and we will not be judged. We will be blessed because we believe in Jesus now and we have faith in Him now. That's something that should excite us. It shouldn't scare us. And let me just take a quick sidebar here. I want you to hear, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, how exposed you are. It's really important for me to state that. If you do not believe in Jesus, you are not protected. And if you are not believing in Jesus, you will not experience His last judgment or this last time as good to you. You will be judged and you will be taken out of His presence forever. We won't. We will be taken into His presence. I've used the adoption or, or, or the metaphor of adoption before, but let me, let me just state that again. Think about the parents finding the child, committing to the child, telling the child to pack your stuff, we're going to come and get you one of these days. And the child waiting in the foster care system, going, I'm going home. I am going home. Once the parent comes and picks up the child, it's home forever. You will never go back. That's what we are being saved for. We can wait for this coming judgment and be excited because the blessing of Jesus coming again means that we will be with Him forever. We are being guarded for this salvation that is ready to be revealed when He deems the time is right. And then we will feel more at home than we've ever felt before. What a glorious vision of the future. We have hope because Jesus was raised from the dead. And we can have a living hope because we've been given a new birth. We've been given an inheritance. And we are protected and guarded. Praise Jesus for all of this. Let's pray. And while I pray, Meryl, I want to invite you to, uh, to come to the stage for a response song. Lord Jesus, just like Peter, we want to break out in a song of praise. Just praise you for who you are and for what you've done for us. We want to rest in the certainty that we've been chosen by Father, Spirit, and Son. We just want to rest in the reality of what we've been given by your mercy. We want to hear these words this morning, Lord Jesus, and we want to be strengthened and encouraged by it. We don't want to give up regardless of what we are going through because we know what we believe. We don't want to listen to the voices of the people doubting or to people scoffing at us in our lives. We want to hold on to this. We want to stand with this assurance. We want to have this um, seep deep into our heads and into our hearts today. And we want to respond accordingly. We want to thank you, Father God, for your great, great, great mercy. We want to thank you for a imperishable and undefiled and never spoiling or diminishing inheritance that you've given to us. May this give us hope. May we experience hope now. May we speak words of hope in this week to come. May we give hope to other people. May we live out this hope. Creating us this beautiful living hope, Lord Jesus, through the resurrection of you. We pray that in your name.